Hi guys, welcome back to In Case of Econ Struggles, welcome to another micro struggle. Today I'm going to do a really quick video specifically on difference curves, what they are, how to interpret them, and how they fit into this utility maximization problem. Timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's just jump right into it. First, I just want to give a motivating example to sort of help you understand what exactly an indifference curve is. An indifference curve just means all the points or all the bundles of things that give us the same level of utility. But what in the world does that mean? How can we do that with a little less math? Well, let's take Bill here. Bill is in college and Bill is trying to decide what he wants to do with his Friday night. And he's trying to hit a certain level. He wants to have a certain amount of fun on his Friday night. With this Friday night, he can choose two different things, the amounts of two different things. He can socialize and he can sleep. And Bill is trying to figure out how many hours do I want to socialize and how many hours do I want to sleep in order to have a fun night. So you can see on this table right here, I've got all the different combinations for Bill where Bill says, okay, this combination means that I'll have a fun night. This combination also means I'll have a fun night. So I could either not socialize with my friends at all and I could sleep 12 hours, that would be fun for me. I could socialize for eight full hours with my friends and then sleep for two hours, that would also be just as fun. I could socialize for four hours and sleep for four hours. Any of these combinations that you see on this table will give Bill the same amount of fun. He will say, I had a fun night tonight. And so an indifference curve would just connect the points, 0, 12, 2, 8, and all the way down to 8, 2 and you would basically trace out all the combinations in between, that would say Bill would have a fun night. It would give Bill the same amount of fun on his night. And that's what an indifference curve is. Again, an indifference curve is just gonna tell Bill, here are all the options that you have if you wanna have the same level of fun on your Friday night. So let's go ahead and graph this. So when I graph this, first of all, you can see that I'm a terrible drawer and that my axes do not align at all. So what I've done is in addition to plotting out those points that we just saw in the table, I sort of took this red line and sort of traced out what a general indifference curve should look like. Again, because any deviations are sort of due to the fact that I can't really draw and not the case that these green points are exactly what an indifference curve tends to look like. So I've labeled some of these points just to give us a better idea. So maybe here's point A when Bill is socializing a lot and sleeping little. Here's point C where Bill is sort of doing a bit of both. And here's point B where Bill is doing more sleeping than socializing. Now, because we said that all of these points give Bill the same amount of fun on his Friday night, we know that the utility, and we're calling utility the amount of fun that Bill is having on his Friday night, the utility of A is equal to the utility of B is equal to the utility of C. Why is that? Because again, we're on the same indifference curve, so they all give Bill the same amount of fun on his Friday night. And if they all give Bill the same amount of fun on his Friday night, then they all need to have the same utility. Now the slope of this indifference curve is pretty typical. You can see that the slope is not constant over all combinations of socializing and sleeping. Why is that? Well, first remember that the slope of the indifference curve is a marginal rate of substitution. All that says is how many hours of socializing is Bill willing to trade for hours of sleeping in order to keep the same amount of fun on his Friday night, the same utility, be on the same indifference curve, they all mean the same thing. So let's start at point C. So at point C, it's uh, approximately like a one-to-one -one trade for Bill between socializing and sleeping. Bill's got a bit of both, so he's sort of indifferent between one hour of socializing and one hour of sleeping. Now, if you start to take away Bill's sleep and you start to come on this part of the indifference curve here, so maybe this point and this point here, you can see Bill does not have a lot of sleep. He's at like two hours of sleep right now. So if you want Bill to give up another hour of sleep when Bill doesn't have that much sleep, well, you're gonna need to give Bill a lot of hours of socializing in order to make him willing to make that trade. Now, if we go the other way, if we go more towards this way on the indifference curve between like maybe B and the end here, you can see that the same thing is happening, but in the opposite direction. So at B, Bill is only having two hours of socialization with his friends. He's sleeping a lot. So if you tell Bill, hey Bill, how much sleep are you willing to trade to socialize an hour less? Bill's gonna say, well, I'm already only hanging out with my friends for two hours. So if you want me to give up another hour of hanging out with my friends, another hour of socializing, I'm gonna have to be able to sleep for a lot more hours because I already have a lot of sleep. So the marginal utility, the extra benefit that I get from that sleep 
is less than the margin utility or the extra benefit I get from an hour of socializing. So I'm gonna have to know that I'm gonna sleep a lot more in order for you to convince me to hang out with my friends for an hour less over on this point of the curve. And that's why it gets super flat. And on the other side, like we said before, that's why this indifference curve gets super steep here. So that's the basic idea behind an indifference curve, behind the margin rate of substitution or the slope of the indifference curve. Again, if this doesn't make sense, make sure to comment below, but let's go on to a more general form of indifference curves with our friend Dave. So here's Dave. Dave says that he likes more stuff, and the reason that Dave liking more stuff is important is because even though one indifference curve tells us all the combinations we need to have a certain amount of fun on our Friday night, or more generally, the combinations that give us the same utility value, we are interested in, well, what gives Dave the best or the highest utility value? And so if we want to answer that question, we need to know where Dave's utility is getting higher. And because we say that Dave likes more stuff, higher utility is going to be up and to the right. So utility is increasing in this direction right here. So you can see based on these two indifference curves that the red indifference curve is up and to the right of the blue indifference curve. So we would say that the utility of the second or the red indifference curve is higher than the utility of the blue indifference curve. So for example, Again, just to review, points C and D are on the same indifference curve. They have the same utility value. B and A similarly are on the same indifference curve. They have the same utility value. But C and D are on a higher indifference curve than B and A, which means that the utility of C is higher than the utility of B, and the utility of D is higher than the utility of A because it's on a higher indifference curve. Now, just to take a quick second, notice that I've drawn these indifference curves parallel to each other. Why am I doing that? Why do they not touch? Let me show you why they don't touch. So let's take a new indifference curve. Let's call it indifference curve green. And I am going to draw this indifference curve in a wonky way just so they touch. So let's say it goes through D like this. Let's say this is IC3. And maybe this is point, I don't know. We'll call this point Z. Okay, so indifference curve green touches both blue and red indifference curve. Why is that bad? So here's why that's bad. Utility of C is equal to utility of D, and utility of Z is equal to utility D because they are on the same indifference curve. D is on both the red and the green indifference curve, but we're saying that point C is up and to the right of Z. So that means that C should have a higher utility than Z. But wait a second, we said that the utility of C is equal to D, and Z is equal to D, so then C should also be equal to Z but we're also saying that the utility of C is greater than the utility of Z. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That can't be right. So what this means just basically is these indifference curves will never touch. So I'm going to take this out because that's a bad indifference curve. And that is why these indifference curves are drawn parallel to each other. And again, indifference curves that are up and to the right have higher utility. Now, why is it true that we need to use this indifference curve? What is the point of this tangency point? Why do we set the marginal ratio of substitution equal to the slope of the budget constraint in class? Well, this is why. So Dave likes more stuff, but he only has so much money. If X and Y are just two goods in a department store, Dave would really like to be out here, but he can't because he doesn't have enough money. So we need to restrict Dave's options to just the things that he can afford. And what we're going to see is if we plot this budget constraint where the slope is the ratio of the prices and we plot this indifference curve exactly like we did before, you can see that at this green point they barely touch and the point at which they barely touch is called the point of tangency. That's where their slopes are equal. That's where the ratio of the prices is equal to the marginal ratio of substitution because of the fact that if you look at green point versus say point B or point A, all three of these points have the same utility. Dave cannot afford point A because it's up and to the right of his budget constraint. Same with B. So this green point is where it's going to happen. One other thing that you can do, you can sort of transform this margin ratio of substitution equal to the ratio of the prices thing. And you can sort of rearrange the fraction and say that at the optimum, at the maximization point, at the solution to the utility maximization problem, the bang for buck of Y, so the amount of extra benefit you get per dollar spent on Y, should be equal to the extra utility per dollar spent on X. And this just means that the bang for buck for Y should be equal to the bang for buck of X at the optimum, and that's all that means. And again, same slope, we say this is the point of tangency or where the two curves are tangent. Just to flesh this out a little more and sort of wrap up, why are we using the maximization point where it is? Well, if I plot three indifference curves, again, they're all parallel because of what we talked about before. 
you can see that this green shaded area and this red line are the affordable bundles for Dave. Now you can see that anything outside of this or up and to the right of that green area and red line are bundles that Dave cannot afford. So if we look at this indifference curve here, which is down and to the left, which means our utility value is less, then yes, there are bundles that I can afford. There are lots of bundles that I can afford in here, but on all these bundles, I can do better. I can hit a higher utility value because I could move up to this blue indifference curve here and I could get to this green point here and that would give me a higher utility than anything on this orange line and I could still afford it. On this other indifference curve way out here, this is really nice. This is a dreamland for Dave, but Dave can't afford this. So even though these indifference curves exist for Dave way out here to the right and they just keep going, it doesn't really matter for Dave because Dave can't afford those bundles anyway. And if Dave can't afford these bundles anyway, then he really doesn't need to think about these indifference curves because they're sort of off into the cloud for Bill. So ultimately, what's going to happen? Bill is going to see his budget constraint. He's going to see all his indifference curves. He is going to choose the indifference curve that says, this is where the slope of my indifference curve is equal to the slope of my budget constraint. So hopefully this just clears up a bunch of things about a difference curves, what they are, and how we use them in the utility maximization problem. If you have questions, put those in the comments below. But if this was helpful, make sure to like and subscribe. We will see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.